Sunday nights. It's as long as the caffeine kicks in and the coffee's working. That's how long I'll be up here. So um, we'll, we'll go with it. All right. Romans uh, chapter, we'll finish chapter eight and we're going to start chapter nine. And everybody said, ooh. Yeah, thank you. And if you don't understand, there's some debate on Romans uh, 9, 10, and 11. We're going to try to dive through some of that. Uh, not all tonight, but we are going to try to dive through some of that. Romans chapter 8, and we'll jump into chapter 9. If you're thinking about a topic tonight, you can write down, I can trust him. I can trust him. Okay? I can trust him. Now, when, when you're studying the Bible and... You got to be careful what parts you pick out and what parts you don't. And as Brother Houston would always say, the Bible is like a puzzle. The pieces have to fit. And therefore, if you come up and have a theology based on some things that don't quite fit and don't quite work, um, it kind of messes the puzzle up a little bit. So as we're studying God's word, um, we need to make sure it fits. But I can trust him. Let's read the last few verses of uh, chapter 8. Let's read them out loud, starting in verse 36. Ready? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The idea which is in, which is through, which is a part of Jesus Christ. What a wonderful thought tonight. I can trust. And we're going to jump into chapter 9 here in just a few moments. Let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we need you and we love you. Lord, I thank you for Jesus. And it's his name we pray. Amen. I had uh, a couple dad jokes I was going to share, but I don't know if they're appropriate for tonight. So I'll just share this story. I was sharing with my Sunday school and uh, only one of them got people laughing. Um, the other ones, they just sat there and stared at you. You know, that, that, that death stare looking at you like, what are we doing here? All right. I can trust him. Are there people it's hard to trust? Anyone know anybody it's kind of hard to trust them? They talk a big game, but you don't want to leave them around your wallet, right? It's hard to trust them. Well, let me tell you this story. I thought this one was good. A man wanted to literally die with all of his money. So he trusted a third party or third part of his money to a priest, a third part to a doctor, and a third part to his lawyer to bury him with it when he died. After his death at the man's funeral, the priest whispered to his dead body and placed a bag in his coffin. Uh, the doctor then proceeded to whisper to the body and placed a bag in there as well. Then the lawyer went and dropped off a bag and moved on. As they were carpooling back from the funeral, the lawyer asked what the priest whispered. The priest, with tears in his eyes, said that he had confessed he spent some of the money on an orphanage so that some hungry kids would not starve, and that he feels bad for what he had done, but that he had no choice. The doctor then admits that he too had to let him know that one of his patients needed a surgery that he alone could not do, that he spent some of the money to save the person's life. The lawyer looks at them with scorn and says, How could you? You have betrayed a man's last and dying request. The doctor and the priest both looked at the lawyer and asked, So your bag had all the money he entrusted you with? To which he replied, Yes, it does. I wrote the check for the full amount, not a penny less. There are certain people you just can't trust, right? Certain people we have a hard time trusting, but we can trust God. And we're going to see as Paul concludes with chapter 8, you remember we've found that all are sinners, all are lost. And then we see this idea, even in the Old Testament, that Abraham was justified by what? By faith. 
by faith. He had faith in Romans chapter 4. It talks about his faith. They were saved the way we're saved by faith, looking for the Messiah, trusting God's plan in the Old Testament. They were looking at God, who God was going to bring. They had faith that God was going to provide the ultimate sacrifice. There is an idea of faith in the Old Testament, faith in the New. And then in chapter 5, we're introduced to this wonderful word that I think all of us should know. In Romans chapter 5, justification. We are just justified or declared innocent with God. We're not going to do it tonight, but a good thing when you start doubting who you are as a child of God, you can look in the mirror and you can say you are justified. You are declared innocent by a holy God because you've done it his way. And then we come to sanctification in chapter 6 through 8. We saw progressive sanctification, ultimate sanctification or glorification when God gives us a new body. But every day in chapter 6 through 8, we are to conform to the image of Christ. That should be our goal. That should be our motto. So the first eight chapters uh, of, this, of this book have to do with the, kind of the, the theology, kind of the digging in and digging deep. And then chapters 9, 10, and 11 have to do with God's promises to Israel. And this kind of determines and gets into the weeds and kind of uh, differentiates us between, say, some of our Reformed friends or some that might be Presbyterian, how they view Israel. We would view Israel just a little different, and we'll get into that in chapters 9, 10, and 11. Chapter 9 talks about Israel's past. Chapter 10 talks about Israel's present. Chapter 11 talks about Israel's future. Let me ask you a question before we get into these chapters. Did God replace Israel with the church? Did all the promises that were meant for Israel, when Israel abandoned God and was taken into captivity, did God say those promises never apply to you, now they're to the local New Testament church of the New Testament? Well, no, we wouldn't believe that, and uh, we're, we're called dispensationalists. We take the Bible literally. I know some of these words don't matter to everybody, but that's kind of how I understand the Bible to be. In chapters 9, 10, and 11, we're going to look at how God views Israel, and we're going to see that God's not done with Israel. But you also have to be very careful not to exclude other parts of the Bible when you read these chapters. And then we see practical Christian living, chapters 12 through chapter 16 in the book of Romans. We're going to see not only have we dug into the deep theological matters, justification, sanctification, and then we saw what God is going to do with Israel, but then we're going to see how to live practically. Do you see how rich the book of Romans is? It doesn't just take us deep into doctrinal uh, thoughts on salvation, but it also shows us God's not done with Israel, and then it shows us how to practically live the Christian life. That's why I believe this is a wonderful book, and we'll get into more of that later on. But you remember in chapter 8, toward the end of it, we understand that there's some problems that come to people. There's suffering. How many of you have experienced suffering? Maybe you're experiencing suffering now. We understand that suffering comes and suffering uh, and depression and kind of come into this chapter. But then we see this crescendo at the end, this, uh, uh, this wonderful thought at the end. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Are you left abandoned when you're suffering, when you're hurting, when you're in pain? No, Christ never lets you go never let you go. We see this crescendo of Romans chapter 8. Let's just talk about these few verses just very quickly because I want to get into chapter 9 tonight and start us into this, these thoughts. So um, some of this may be a, a little, uh, I don't want to use the word deeper because it's all biblical, but some of it may be some new thoughts uh, that you may have not heard of as we get into chapter 9. I'll try to be very clear as we get in here. But we understand, here we find no one can separate us from the love of Christ. And Paul quotes from Psalms chapter 44 and verse 36, he says this, as is it written, excuse me, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We suffer, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. We have all these hardships, we have tribulation, we have distress, we have famine, we have nakedness, we have peril, we have the sword, we suffer. But look at verse 37, chapter 8 in Romans. Nay, in all these things we are more than what? What? 
We are more than conquerors. So why don't Christians live the more than conquerors lifestyle? Why do we live like we are being conquered by these things? No, we are more than conquerors through Christ. Spurgeon's comment on Psalms 44, he said, Yea, assuredly, certainly for thy sake, not for our offenses, but for obeying thee. This is why we suffer. But now in verse 37, he says, Although we suffer and we hurt, we are conquerors through Christ. We are currently conquering right now through Christ. Aren't you glad for Jesus? He's our victor. We win the battle. Satan cannot, and he definitely shouldn't be winning in your life. But now, we kind of, with this idea, nothing can separate us from his love. This leads us, because these promises are written to who? They're written to the saints, the New Testament church. So can God drop his promises of loving us and never separating us from him? Will God ever take that back? So it's with that understanding that we jump now to chapter 9 when there's some confusion and Paul understands some of the Jews might look at it and say, hold on a minute. In the Old Testament, God made promises to Israel that have not all been kept because Israel turned away from God. So with that in mind, is it possible that God will not keep his promise at the end of chapter 8? Do you see why Paul's going to adjust just a little bit and go and talk to directly to Israel and help them to understand God's not done with you yet? Does everybody see why this is going to change a little bit? Because if God could make promises to Israel, and then Israel, uh, they find out, wait a minute, these promises are not for me, they're for the New Testament church, God can take his promises back. Well, that means if God can take his promises back, couldn't he take them back from the church? And maybe it's possible that God could take his promise back from the New Testament church one day that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Do you see why Paul is going to address this in these next few chapters? Do you see where he's come from? And now he jumps into chapter 9. He jumps into chapter 9. How much do we want to get into tonight? Look at verse 1. I say the truth in Christ... I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. As he moves on into a new section, we see what he's just talked about in chapter 8, and now he's going to jump into a, a new topic. Um, and by the way, there'll be some things that will come up divine decree by God and uh, divine uh, human responsibility, excuse me divine decree and human responsibility. And when uh, Charles Spurgeon is asked uh, about how to reconcile with God's sovereignty and human responsibility, this is what he had to say. Um, I never try to reconcile friends. They flow and they work together. Uh, some reformed, the idea of reformed theology Reformed individuals lead us to believe from these next few verses and these next few chapters that we must conclude that God chooses some to heaven and some to hell. And that's not the conclusion I get when I read it. That's not the understanding that I get when I read it. And I want to share with you where God will lead in these next few, next few chapters over the next couple weeks. So what about the people in the Old Testament? What happened to the promises to the Jews in the Old Testament? Israel as a whole rejected him as the Messiah. So are the promises God made to Israel nullified or of none effect or of no good? Well, the answer to that would be no. Did God forget? Uh, some, some maybe in the Presbyterian realm might suggest that God has no interest in Israel. The promises to Israel were handed to the church. I, I don't believe that to be the case. It's the idea of replacement theology. And I don't believe that to be in God's word. God is not done with Israel. May I ask you, church, has God forsaken Israel? No. No. 
No, no, he is not. So let's look at, by the way, I, just for food for thought, those who want to dig a little deeper on the new covenant and Jeremiah 31, that'd be a good study for you to look into Jeremiah 31, what God has in store for his people. But let's look at chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. So I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual what? What is he so broken up about? For I could wish that myself were a curse. It's the idea of anathema from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Let me ask you this. What troubles Paul? So uh, we wrote, wrote the title, I Can Trust Him. That's going to be our conclusion at the end of the message tonight. But I want to look at what troubles Paul. This is Paul's sincerity. What he says in verse 1, this is true and sincere. And then he says in verse 2, I have great heaviness, I have continual sorrow, for I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ. For who? For my brethren. He wanted so badly for the Jews to come to recognize Jesus as the Messiah. So what troubled Paul? That his own Brothers, his own nation had rejected the Messiah as a whole. I just, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but what troubles us, right? A lot of us are going to have trouble this week, and all of us will probably have some disturbances throughout the week, but what could be something greater to be struggling about than the souls of humanity? Paul is so worked up about his, his nation, his people. By the way, I think you and I ought to be concerned about souls too. It ought to break our hearts what's happening in America. It ought to. It ought to break our hearts what's happening down the street. Sometimes I wonder, you know, how much effort we should be putting into what's happening here in our neighborhoods. It ought to trouble us that there are people that are lost. And Paul is saying, man, I love the Jews. I am a Jew. They are my brothers and sisters. And man, if it took that I would be the idea of accursed or anathema is the idea of damned. If I could be damned and all of Israel would be saved, I would be willing to do it. He's so broken. He's so hurt. What troubled Paul? Um, Name some things that Paul struggled, he had some issues with, right? Name some things that Paul suffered through. Just name some. What did Paul go through? Shipwreck, what else? Snake bite, what else? Thorn in the flesh, we're not exactly sure. Some people believe it was in the eyes. What else? What is it? Prison, what else? Beatings. How about loneliness? At times, depression. Why didn't they come to me? God, I wanted Timothy. I needed Titus. I needed somebody. Paul suffered with a lot of big things, but what he says was a continual sorrow of his heart. It was his people. It was his people. You know, you and I, uh, there's several comments. I'm not going to read all of them, but several pastors talk about some things look so big to us and we're troubled about when what ought to be big to us is the souls of individuals. Paul feels this because he considers a people who seem to be separated from the love of God. They don't seem to be right with God. Unbelieving Israel who rejected God's Messiah. Not just sorrow, but a deep abiding or continual sorrow. This was a continual great burden on the heart of this apostle. The word sorrow, I'm going to read a paragraph on this, is the idea of distress of mind, especially implying a sense of of loss, deep distress, sadness, or regret, especially for the loss of someone or something loved, result on happier and unpleasant state. One dictionary says sorrow is derived from the German word care, concern, uneasiness, which is in turn from the same root as sore or heavy. Interesting word, picture of this word, the 1828 Webster's Dictionary has this entry for sorrow. The uneasiness or pain of mind, which is produced by the loss of any good, real or supposed, or by disappointment in the expectation of good. So what brought Paul sorrow? The fact that his nation did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. You know, I heard a pastor talk about, um, he was talking to a, a rabbi, 
Uh, he was on his way to Jerusalem. He sat by a rabbi and for several hours as they sat and they discussed. And one thing I thought was interesting with this pastor as he was talking about this, um, he said, the rabbi told him, we don't have a problem with Jesus. And the pastor looked at him and said, really, you don't have a problem with Jesus? They said, no, we don't have a problem with Jesus. We have a problem with Paul. <laughs> They had a problem with Paul's teachings and Paul's writings, but they said they didn't have a problem with Jesus. Paul was so burdened, uh, proclaiming a message of judgment should be done with compassion, and Paul was so burdened for his people. But I want you to see, number two, not only what troubles Paul should, uh, should trouble us, not just for Israel, even though we should be concerned over the souls in Israel, but the souls around us. Number two, I want you to see this. God's word will not and did not fail. God's word will not and did not fail, specifically Israel. Look at verse uh, four. Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the what? The adoption, we're going to talk about that here in just a moment, and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the what? Okay, there's a couple more things. Verse 5, whose are the fathers and of whom are concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. I never understood these verses as much as I feel like I have a better grasp on them now. So there are some things that were promised to Israel that some people are saying are no longer promised to Israel. They were given to the church. But what pertained to Israel? Well, number one, the adoption. Take your Bible, go to Exodus, Exodus chapter uh, four, 4, Exodus chapter 4. I may have lied to you. Hold on a minute. Brief pause. Exodus 4, verse, uh, verse 22. The Bible says this, And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. There was an adoption. Now who he's talking about here are those who believed were justified. There was an adoption. God's word did not fail Israel. It pertained the adoption. They were his. They belonged to him. And then we see number two, the, the glory. What is the glory? I believe it's in reference to the Shekinah glory or the presence of God. Where was this presence? Where did the presence of God dwell? the tabernacle, or eventually the temple. This is where the Shekinah glory would be. Now, there was a time when God's glory would leave Israel. I believe that's found, I think, in Ezekiel, I think chapter 11. God's glory would leave Israel for a time. He would depart from them because of their actions, because of their lifestyle. God's glory would leave that place. They had turned from him. But these were promises God had made. They were adopted. God had given him his glory. God's presence, I believe in Ezekiel chapter 11, would eventually leave the mercy seat. But then what else did God give to Israel? He gave them the covenants. What are the covenants? The Abrahamic covenant. This is the title to Israel. By the way, um, I support Israel wholeheartedly in the land that they're in. And I believe, as a matter of fact, they own more land than what they are given. I believe God gave that to them. It is their right to have that land. It is not for the Palestinians. I will support Israel. I will pray for Israel. I will personally send money to help Israel. I believe that is their land promised by God. We see the Abrahamic covenant. We see the Mosaic covenant with the law. We see the Davidic covenant, uh, the, the, the claim to the Judean throne. God made them this covenant, and then eventually we'll see the new covenant in Jeremiah chapter 31, the new covenant with them one day. But God has given them this covenant, these legal agreements made by God. So the question is, when Israel turned their back on God, did God take these away? 
Then we see what else does the Bible said he gave them? The giving of the law, the law of Moses, which was unique to Israel. I am not under the law, but under grace. These uh, were, uh, uh, our laws, by the way, are repeated in the New Testament. The Bible says we're not under the law, but these laws were for this theocracy in the wilderness with the children of Israel. He gave them the law. This was something unique to Israel. And then we see the service of God. What else did God gave them? God gave them unique access to him through the sacrifices. Did you know God didn't give that to any other nation? God did not give it to the Moabites to sacrifice to him in this manner. God gave that to the children of Israel, specifically to a certain tribe in Israel, but God gave this. It was unique to Israel. What else did God give? God gave them service to, to serve in the temple or through the temple. What else did he give? He gave them promises. What promises? From Genesis to Malachi. They are to Israel. And obviously we can take from that. But then we see in verse 5, the founding fathers. Whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came? The founding fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. The founding fathers God gave to them. So the people of Israel would look back at the fathers and they would look at the covenant and the promises that God gave to them. And the question Paul is trying to answer is, did God take away those promises once Israel turned their back on him? The answer is no, he did not. Christ came. Look at verse 5 once again. Whose are the fathers, and of, whom, uh, um, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came? This is Jesus. From the line of Israel, Christ came. He is Messiah, and the promises he made to the church, and the promises he made to the people are just as certain. The divine status of Christ. God has not abandoned his people. Now... What are we talking about tonight? Some teach that these things were taken away from Israel and God has replaced it with the church. And I'm here to say that that is wrong and not true. So the Bible says this at the end of verse 5, who is overall God blessed forever. Amen. That's Jesus who came from the line of Israel. Now, not every Israelite is a regenerated Israelite. Okay? We see a couple things. There's racial, there's a physical Israelites, and then there are religious Israelites. They believe in the Old Testament, but not the New. And then there are regenerated Jews or Israelites. There are Jews who have trusted Jesus and have accepted him as their Messiah. And by the way, I know there's some disagreement when exactly a majority of the Jews will be saved, whether it's during the, the, the tribulation or shortly thereafter. At some point in God's timetable, a large majority of Jews will come to know Christ as the Messiah. I don't know exactly when. I know there's some disagreement on that. But before, God's, uh, before God officially gives us the new heaven and the new earth, a large portion of Israel will be saved. A large portion of the Jews will be saved. But look at verse 6, and I think, I think we'll, be, we'll, be, we'll, we'll uh, wrap up a couple of things here tonight. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all what? Which are of what? Okay, so he's talking about they're not all regenerated. They're not all. Now, they may be Israelites or Jews in name, but they're not all regenerated. Not every Israelite is a regenerated Israelite because we know the only way to be regenerated and born again is through what? Through shed blood of Jesus Christ. It's through Christ. He's already established that in the early parts of the book of Romans. Now, what do we do as, as this idea, what do we do uh, with the promises of God that were to Israel that some might say are now no longer to Israel but to the church? Well, I want you to look at one, one thing here tonight and consider this. Israel has not been rejected by God. They've not been rejected by God, as some might teach. And Paul is going to go into a little a deeper thoughts on this. Many will come to Christ as the Messiah sometime during the tribulation, I believe. God chose them and has a plan for them. But tonight, I want to encourage you with this. Last thing I want you to write down. Last thing. Trust God's promise, not our heritage. 
We have a trust in God's promises, not our heritage. So Paul will go on to defend the faithfulness of God. Has God been faithful? Will God always keep his word? So why is it so often that we doubt him? Why is it so often that we fail to keep his word and not trust in him? God will always keep his words to us. That's why we can trust him. It's a lot of things I depend on. There's a lot of people I trust. There's a lot of, there's a lot of groups that I really put a lot of faith or stock into. But the one I ought to trust with all my heart is God. Because every promise he made, he will keep. Let's go back up to chapter 8, if you would. Let's go back up to chapter 8. Okay, and once again, we'll get farther into chapter 9 and into chapter 10, Lord willing, next week. I want to talk about Israel, their, their, their present, their, their past, and their future. We'll talk about all those things, and we'll talk about the uniqueness of God's divine sovereignty and the ability to do as he wills, and yet man still has free human will. We'll get into more of that. We'll get into this idea of uh, when it talks about uh, God uh, loved Jacob and hated Esau. Saw we'll get into some of these things that might be a little more challenging. But for tonight, I want to end just on this thought. And we'll be done here very quickly, but just end on this thought. Go back to chapter 8 when he talked about who shall separate us from the love of Christ in verse 35. And then he talked about the suffering that they would endure and that people would endure for the cause of Christ in verse 36. And then he says, nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors. That is a promise from God. And then in verse 38 and 39 he says, I am persuaded. Nothing can separate me from the love of God and the love of Christ. Right? So in our daily lives, Christ loved me. And nothing can take me from him. And I trust him. Christ loves me. I'm in his family. I'm his child. There's nothing uh, demonic. There's nothing satanic that can separate me from his love. There's nothing I can do that can separate me from his love. He is mine. I am his. This is a promise. I belong to him. There's comfort and there's confidence in that. I can trust him. Jesus. I can trust his word. Now, the next few chapters are going to be, uh, we're going to go a little farther into some of them as we go, but I want you to remember this. You can trust him. This morning we talked about in, in our Sunday school uh, with our, uh, we're going through the miracles of Jesus and we saw Jesus after he healed the demonic individual, he walked into Peter's house and they, they went to Jesus and they said, Jesus, you know, his mother-in-law was sick and they besought Jesus for her is what the Bible says. And Jesus would look at her and he would rebuke the sickness and this built a trust in Jesus. Not only does he have power over the demons, not only does he have power over the wind and the waves, but he has power over our very sickness, and we can trust him. Do you trust him tonight? Do you believe that all the promises that he has made, he will keep? Have you clung to those, can you say clung? Have you grabbed onto those promises and held onto them tight? You can't trust him. He'll not let us down. Just like with Israel, he still has a plan. He didn't let them go. He still has a goal for them. He has not said, you know what, Israel, I want nothing to do with you. Now it's the church. You had your chance. Now you get nothing. That's not what God said at all. And in these next few chapters, we're going to find that out. We can trust him. Trust God's promises, not your heritage. Let's have a word of prayer tonight. Heavenly Father, God, we do love you and we thank you for Jesus. And Lord, I pray each one of us would learn to trust you in a greater way. Lord, as we read and we study and we try to understand your word and get a grasp on it, Lord, I pray that each one of us would consider you are all powerful. You are in control. And the promises you made to Israel, you will keep. And Lord, help us as these times come to a close. Lord, when your work on this earth is done and you create a new heaven and a new earth, help us to look for your promises to be fulfilled. Help us not to grow weary in well-doing, but to trust you. Lord, we need you. God, I thank you for your people. In Jesus' name, amen.